Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Constitutional Chats. This week, we're going to be discussing the 23rd and 24th Amendments with our special guest, the former Attorney General of Virginia, Ken Cuccinelli. Now, we are um, expecting our founder and co-president, the actress Janine Turner, to join us a little bit later today. As you all may know, Texas has been hit with the worst winter storm in decades, and they're expecting more snow tonight. There are rolling power outages. Janine is currently without power and is working hard to take care of her ranch and animals. So we send her our prayers and we will look forward to hopefully her being able to get on. But I'm gonna go ahead now and introduce the rest of our panel that we have here today. And then we'll move to uh, introducing Attorney General Cuccinelli. And actually, before I start, I want to thank uh, our sponsor for today's constitutional chat. Our sponsor, is an anonymous donor from Lincoln, Massachusetts. Now our donor has been supporting Constituting America since 2016, and we're very grateful for his support. He served as a mentor trip sponsor on some of our mentor trips and has supported us many times over the last five years. And he wrote to me when he, when he agreed to sponsor this episode of our chat, he said, the value of your instruction has and will bear results in younger generations. Only God knows now the impact of your work. And he said, hopefully we'll see the manifestation of it in the near future. And I, we already are seeing the manifestation of it. We think, and we thank our sponsor for making it possible. So thank you very much for, for sponsoring today's chat. Now, as I mentioned, Janine Turner is gonna be joining us soon. Um, but I want to say a little bit about Janine. Janine is our founder and co-president. She is famous for her role as Maggie O'Connell in television's Northern Exposure. She founded Constituting America in 2010 and has served as co-president since, uh, since it launched in 2010. Janine is still acting, but she's also actively teaching kids about the U.S. Constitution, having given over 540 speeches to classrooms across the country. So we are thank Janine for her leadership and looking forward to hopefully her joining us here in a little bit. Now, I also want to introduce Tova Kaplan, our national youth director, who is with us today uh, on our panel. Tova is a 17-year-old student from Chicago, Illinois. She's a three-time winner of the We the Future contest. As I mentioned, Tova is our national youth director of Constituting America. She runs our youth advisory board and she is passionate about inspiring young people to know and to use their constitutional rights. So welcome, Tova. Would you like to say hello? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Um, thank you to our guest, and thank you so much to our sponsor. Um, you're so generous. Speaking as a young person, I know I already have benefited from their work, and I'm sure generations. Um, and I hope everyone's staying safe and warm right now. I definitely have snow uh, falling outside right now, but have a great show, everyone. Yes, Toba's fighting the snow also. Now, not with us today uh, due to illness is Dakari Chapman, but I want to say a few words about Dakari. He is an 18-year-old student from North Carolina. He's Constituting America's Student Ambassador, serves on our Youth Advisory Board, and is a two-time winner of Constituting America's We the Future contest. Dakari is a working actor and will be seen in season two of Netflix hit series Outer Banks. He's guest stars on many other television shows, and you may even see him in a movie soon. So Dakari, we hope that you are feeling better, and um, we will see you on our next chat. I'm now very honored to introduce our special guest for today, the former Attorney General of Virginia, Ken Cuccinelli. 
The Honorable Ken Cuccinelli served as Virginia's Attorney General from 2010 to 2014, leading the Commonwealth in fighting human trafficking and leading record enforcement against gangs, healthcare fraud, and child predators. Attorney General Cuccinelli also served in the Senate of Virginia from 2002 to 2010 and has practiced law for over 25 years. Most recently, Ken served as the Acting Director of U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services and then as Acting Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. He's currently serving as a visiting fellow at the Heritage Foundation with a focus on immigration, border security, China, and other homeland security issues. And I do want to give a, a special shout out to the Heritage Foundation. They're such a great organization. They've helped us uh, with so, find so many of our guests for our constitutional chat. So thank you so much to the Heritage Foundation. Ken earned a mechanical engineering degree from the University of Virginia, a law degree from Anton Scalia Law School at George Mason University, and a master's in international commerce and policy from George Mason University. Ken and his wife, Tiro, grew up and live in Virginia and have seven children, one son-in-law, and most awesome of all, two grandchildren. Ken Cuccinelli, welcome to Constitutional Chats. We are so excited to have you today. Well, Kathy, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So we thought that uh, maybe we would start with you just giving us a little bit of an overview of the two amendments that we're going to be discussing today in our series, The Amendments in You. We had put uh, Amendments 23 and 24 are on our agenda today. And if you'd want to just maybe give us a little overview of those two amendments. Sure, glad to. They passed near in time to one another in the early 60s. And the 23rd Amendment um, was an effort to give the people who lived in Washington, D.C., uh, the nation's capital, uh, the right to pick electors when voting for president. So because the District of Columbia is not a state, they don't have a congressman, they don't have senators, and at that time they didn't have a say in the presidential election. Um, and there's a long history to this all the way back to the founding period that we can talk about happily. Um, but at the time in the early 60s when this amendment was passed, uh, it was really impelled by the civil rights movement because Washington DC was an overwhelmingly black majority city. And it was deemed a way to give them representation in picking the president. It was bipartisan. There was nothing particularly political about it. President Eisenhower supported it. Um, as did uh, everybody on both sides of the aisle. Uh, I say everybody, but overwhelmingly, it was not everybody. Um, and it was pretty quickly ratified. Um, and so what the Washington DC residents now have is the same number of electors, three, as the smallest state. That's how they're measured. They can't have more than the smallest state. And um, so ever since then, they've participated in the presidential elections. Um, and um, with one exception, what's called a faithless elector in 2000, um, they <clears throat> have voted for uh, the Democratic Party candidate for president since that time. But um, for the not quite 200 years, 160 years before then, the residents of DC did not have um, a say in the presidential election. So again, this was viewed as uh, something uh, that was motivated by the civil rights movement. It wasn't a particular focus necessarily, but it was something that could be done and was pretty popular in Congress. And it obviously got the 38 states that it needed and it needed 38 because Hawaii and Alaska had just become states. And if I remember correctly, both of them voted to ratify this amendment. So that's the 23rd amendment. The 24th amendment is actually, that's the 24th, all right. No, 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 I've got it right. That's the 23rd amendment. The 24th amendment um, was a little more, had a little more contentious history to it. The 24th amendment eliminated poll taxes um, as a tool that states would be allowed to use as a condition of voting. And at the time the amendment passed in the early 60s, I wanna say there were still five states, including my own, Virginia, that imposed poll taxes. 
<clears throat> poll taxes were something that really grew up out of the reaction to the Civil War. So when I say the reaction, I mean, after the Civil War, the federal government um, really imposed reconstruction on the South and, uh, in, and, and really had some excellent civil rights legislation in the early 70s, much unheralded Ulysses S. Grant. Um, he, a lot of his press these days is about his, his uh, cigar smoking and uh, how he purportedly liked alcohol too much. Um, that was a controversy the whole time. But as president, he was extremely aggressive in advancing civil rights in the South. Um, a lot of that was undone in the reaction as the federal government withdrew its power from the South. Um, uh, the one party rule took over and they started imposing limitations on voting that weren't directly related to race, but their purpose was to exclude black voters from being able to vote. And again, my home state of Virginia is a, I say good example. It's a, an example of this phenomenon. The powers that be around 1902 rewrote our constitution in such a way that they could impose poll taxes and do other things, impose reading literacy requirements and so forth. A variety of tests for voting that disproportionately excluded black Virginians and in other states, uh, uh, the, the blacks in those states, um, though it also affected poor whites as well, uh, but they weren't necessarily the target. The target was the exclusion of black voters. And uh, this was gradually reduced over time but as I said, even into the 1960s, when this amendment passed, there were still five states, I want to say Virginia, Texas, Mississippi, mm, the others escape me at the moment. There are a couple others. Alabama and Arkansas were the other. Okay, Alabama and Arkansas, uh, all Southern states um, that were still using poll taxes as a condition of voting. And that was eliminated by the 24th Amendment. So uh, where the 23rd Amendment was less controversial overall, the 24th, because of the history uh, of poll taxes, was a bit more controversial, but it's also part of why it was needed. Uh, so those are the two amendments we're talking about today. There's a lot wrapped up in there that we could talk about, and I'm happy to answer any of your questions about it. Uh, I love talking about the Constitution. There's so much history to, to, to learn about here. Well, thank you. That was fascinating. And we are really grateful to have you on today. I, I thought maybe we would start with the 23rd and talk just a little bit about how Washington DC became our capital. We were, sure. when you and I talked earlier, uh, you were talking a little bit about a compromise that took place uh, for Washington DC to become the capital of the United States. So at the founding era, um, where the capital was located was a bigger deal than it is today. Today you think, well, you know, uh, We'll take Tova. I'm in Chicago. I'll just take a plane to Washington, right? Well, in 1787, you didn't take a plane anywhere. You went at the speed of a horse or a ship. And so it really did matter where the capital was in terms of the access uh, that your representatives would have to the capital. That's point one. Point two, if you remember colonial history, governors would frequently dissolve legislatures. They would, they would uh, seize the armories of the colonies to keep the legislators from being able to have access to them. In fact, the shot heard around the world that started the American Revolution was British troops marching out to seize an armory so that the colonialists in Massachusetts wouldn't have access to those guns or gunpowder. Uh, that's, that's what started the war. That's what started the shooting of the war. And uh, so where we don't think so much 
in American history about physical access to the capital, it was a big deal in the founding period, a very big deal. And so when the constitution was being written and original laws were being put in place, part of the deal between the Northern states and the Southern states was that the capital would be, would straddle the Potomac. It would be along the Potomac. And um, it ended up of course being what we now know as Washington DC. But imagine, I mean, today, would we think about making a deal where we're literally gonna start a city in the middle of nowhere? Because that's what they did. There was nothing there. It wasn't a small metropolis, they made a big one. There was nothing. They literally created the capital city from nothing. Now, um, it, it, I'm sure it was an attraction that George Washington lived right there. Um, and uh, he, he certainly wanted it there. And he carried a lot of influence at that time, as you might imagine. Um, but it was that Northern Southern compromise to access the capital that was part of the overall package deal, if you will, um, uh, for formulating the powers of the states uh, within the new constitutional structure. So it took a number of years to buy the land and to, to build the facilities and so forth, but they did all that through the 1790s um, and began using the capital there um, not long, maybe a decade after the constitution had been ratified, a little less, a little more, I'm sorry, and um, built the White House, built the Capitol and so on uh, as we all see it now. But that's why Washington grew up. If you look in the Constitution, you will not find Washington, D.C. It's not in there anywhere. It refers in Article One, uh, almost at the end of Article One, to a federal district that Congress will have control over and that that district would be no bigger than 10 miles square. Now, I didn't double check before we got on today, but I'm pretty sure the original was 10 miles square and it was in a diamond shape. So um, it straddled the Potomac and uh, unbeknownst to most people that from up until 1846, part of Alexandria and Arlington counties in Virginia on our side of the Potomac was part of Washington, DC. It was part of the federal district. In 1846, Congress gave back the land that Virginia had provided for the nation's capital. I, I assume they did that simply because they weren't using it and because of the Potomac, they didn't envision using it for federal district purposes, um, but that was the path taken. If you, again, if you look at Article One, <clears throat> it, it refers to land being ceded for the purpose of an, being a nation's capital. So when you hear people talk about making Washington DC a state, there is the little issue that um, the, the land came from Maryland, just like the land that came back to Virginia came to Virginia. So an argument can be made that a more appropriate solution along those lines is just keep shrinking the federal district down to just the Capitol and the White House and the Supreme Court and a few other things and just give that land and those people back to Maryland and they have their representation in Maryland. Of course, if you did that, then you'd have a 23rd amendment giving electoral votes to what might be a few guys sleeping in the nation's capital. <laughs> and that's about it. Um, but uh, that's the history of why Washington is there. That's its place in the constitution. Um, prior to the 23rd amendment, <clears throat> there really wasn't a lot of constitutional um, adjustments made to anything related to the nation's capital um, and how it was run or operated. You hear a lot more of that discussion during the lifetimes of the people on this call than ever happened in all of our history before that. Well, and I just, I never knew that, I always knew that Virginia and Maryland 
gave the land to establish uh, Washington, D.C. Right. But I didn't know that that I guess the Congress in 1846 gave Virginia gave part of Virginia's land back to Virginia. So that's, you know, we're always learning things on constitutional chats, but that is definitely something that that I didn't know at all. Um, now, just staying with the uh, theme of, of the 23rd Amendment a little bit longer, I wanted to mention, because some of our younger listeners might not know, I, you had mentioned how we came to have Washington, D.C. as our capital, but when the Congress very first met, they first met uh, in Federal Hall in New York City, I, I think. Is that right? Or do Well, you know as the federal that? government, yes, before that. Philadelphia, under the Constitution, before that, Philadelphia was uh, the nation's capital. Um, and a couple of times they had to flee the British. So the ca <laughs> capital got mobile there briefly a couple of times, too. So they met in Philadelphia. And then um, it looks like when they when the Constitution was ratified, maybe that's when they started meeting in Federal Hall in 1789, because I think they did. Washington served as president in New York City. And he was inaugurated, I think, on the on the steps of Federal Hall. Yes, possibly. I believe you're right. Because we um, we took our Constituting America winners to New York City one year for the the mentor trip that they won, and I remember oh, we got to tour Federal Hall. And if if any of our listeners have have not had the chance to tour Federal Hall in New York City, I really recommend it. It was very interesting, and uh, it's really it's an, an interesting part of New York City as well. But um, Toba, I thought we'd go to you and see if you have any questions on the 23rd Amendment, and um, then we'll uh, go to some listener questions, and then we'll uh, go into the 24th Amendment. How does that sound? Great. Um, I have a lot of questions, I guess, surrounding the amendment. So um, how long was this fight for DC representation? Was it around from the beginning of the district, or was it a more modern invention? An excellent question. It was a much more modern occurrence. Um, it really was not a subject that was given a great deal of, uh, that there was much concern over for most of the history of Washington, DC. And as I mentioned, it really became a thing, if you will, during the civil rights era in the 50s. <clears throat> you know, with the civil rights movement began in earnest in the 1950s course it it went into the 60s as I'm sure you all know but it was at that point that discussion began about hey look we've got this nation's capital that's predominantly a black city and they don't get to vote for president and um, that was the main focus of that discussion again it wasn't a focus it wasn't a priority item of the civil rights movement but that's what that's what spawned the question to, to your point, Tova. That's what really sparked people to say, hey, shouldn't we do something about this? And once they decided that, once the amendment was proposed, I wanna say that it was ratified in only about two years, maybe even less. And that's pretty doggone fast for a constitutional amendment outside the Bill of Rights era. Why was it so bipartisan? I don't think anything else in the civil rights movement came that easily. Why, why was it so well, bipartisan? I, I, you, you know, you may be surprised. I mean, the, the split on civil rights legislation was even then regional. <clears throat> it wasn't partisan. A higher proportion of Republicans were voting for these things than Democrats. And the reason for that is that the Southern states were represented by Democrats who opposed this stuff. So the Democrat party was much more split than the Republican party was on these sorts of issues. As I mentioned, Dwight Eisenhower was the most prominent supporter of this amendment. Of course, as president, he doesn't have a role other than to use his bully pulpit to advance it, but he was also the president that forcibly integrated schools in the South where uh, the governor of Arkansas, Faubus, famously stood in the doorway, and it was President Eisenhower who sent National Guardsmen to accompany um, those children into the school and to make sure they were safe because the president didn't believe 
that the state authorities would uh, would keep them safe. And he may well have been right. Um, and uh, he took action on that. So and, and he was not he was well supported by the people in the Republican Party now. So let's fast forward 50 years. And of course, we're not talking Republican Democrat here per se, but understand that over time, the uh, the alignments in our among our citizens between the parties have have changed some, and um, in part because Lyndon Johnson was the guy who really put civil rights legislation over the top, not just these amendments we're talking about, because they were bipartisan except for the for the regional aspect of it, not from the South. So if you look at the ratification of the 23rd and 24th amendments, you don't see a lot of Southern states. You do see some, but um, Tennessee comes to mind, but, but you don't see all of them. And that's where and you look at the rest of the map of the United States, they did ratify. So it was still a regional split then, more than a party split. Um, and then I don't know if you can answer this, but demographically, how, how did it become a majority uh, African-American um, district? When did that happen? You know, um, I'm not real sure, honestly. Uh, I don't know that that particular the demographic history, even though I've lived in Northern Virginia my whole life, I even went to high school in Washington. Um, but um, I don't know when that began to happen. Um, you know, it, really in the capital was, I mean, it's, it's a nation's capital and there were people flocking there for government reasons from the time it was created, which George Washington was hoping to see. He thought that was a good thing. Um, but that also meant um, an awful lot of work was going on there that, you know, you wouldn't find if you went 15 miles in any direction at that time into Maryland or Virginia. Uh, so it was a, it was an oasis of a city. And um, so people who were coming there were really coming there to live and work there. Um, they weren't, they, w there wasn't commuting as we would see today. So um, you know, that phenomena existed when, when the heavy influx of Black citizens uh, arose. I can't really speak to, Tova. I'm not sure of that history exactly. I did a quick Google, and it looks like um, it happened around the time of the Civil War, um, and often because um, meant some states did not permit free Black Americans to stay after gaining their freedom. So a lot stayed in the District of Columbia to avoid that. Okay. Yeah, and so at that time, um, my last question, sorry, Kathy, um, when at the same time they were passing the 23rd Amendment to give electoral representation, were they pushing, um, like the push we have now to get congressional representation, like the people who are pushing to make Washington DC a state are doing it, you know, because of, you know, they, they want um, representation in in Congress. So was there a, a parallel push at the same time? And can you talk about that debate today? Because I read interestingly that DC would be the only majority black state in the country. So it's kind of that same dynamic going on. So um, my understanding, and, and my understanding comes largely from my study of the constitution rather than sort of the demographic history is that no, uh, there wasn't a great push for statehood at that time. That is a much more recent phenomena, and it is a much more political phenomena um, because everyone has seen how the district will vote. Um, it is undoubted that if you create a state, then you add two Democrat Party senators and one Democrat Party congressman. So that's that is actually the primary motivation at the moment. And that's kind of an unfortunate way to decide things, but that's where we are at this point in our history. Okay, well, um, we have got a couple of listener comments on the 23rd Amendment. Um, I'm trying to scroll back to them now. Uh, 
Danya Konicki, who's a student uh, who regularly listens with us, asks, if DC residents can vote in presidential elections, why was this right not also extended to American Samoa, Guam, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands? Does the 14th Amendment not apply? So uh, there's never really been, first of all, their territories. And um, you can look back through the, the, from the 13 original colonies as we expanded across the continent, they didn't vote for president or anything else when they were a territory. Um, it was one of the benefits of becoming a state. And um, uh, so they're treated no differently than any territory has ever been treated in American history. Um, you know, there's also the question of just connection and distance and uh, should, uh, Port in the case of Puerto Rico, statehood has been discussed. It's never been discussed for the others. They're really more than anything what are called protectorates. They, we get the benefit of our association with them, like our military can build bases there and do other things, and they get the benefit of our protection. Um, and, and we have interaction. They're small, but we have economic interaction with them, except for Puerto Rico, which has, I'm being very rough here, about 4 million population, which is almost half of Virginia. Um, the others are 50,000 or 100,000 approximately. Um, so they're very small, um, relatively speaking. So those are the differences there. And um, it continues to be a debate, at least in Puerto Rico. And it's almost an even split. It has been for years there, 50-50, about whether they even want to be a state or not. Okay. Um, turning to the 24th Amendment, uh, Professor James Klinger writes, the 24th Amendment forbids the payment of poll taxes as a qualification for voting in federal elections, but did any state continue to require poll taxes to vote in state and local elections? Yes, is the answer to that question, but only for two years because the Supreme Court then voted six to three to say that those poll taxes were a violation of the Equal Protection Clause, the 14th Amendment you referenced earlier. And um, so one might ask, well, then why didn't they rule that way without the amendment? Um, and um, honestly, I think the amendment should have been written to forbid them in federal and state elections, but it wasn't. And um, so uh, in 1937, the Supreme Court had previously ruled that poll taxes were constitutional, that there wasn't a problem with them. So it really looks like the Supreme Court there is cherry picking. Um, and it, you know, it became the thing to do in the 60s, right? To, to protect against these sorts of impositions. And so they did it. But judges are supposed to decide what the constitution means based only on what it says and, and, and the law, but they clearly changed their mind. And it just given the 1930s environment versus the 1960s environment, it sure looks an awful lot like they wanted a particular outcome. And so they voted for it. Um, but I have no doubt that the 24th Amendment gave them a huge impetus um, to do that and the cover for it, if you will. Um, and I say that that's not a legal comment. That's just something it's important to remember that I tell young lawyers, and I know you all aren't in law school yet, but um, in law school, they teach you what's called the burden of proof. And you've all always heard it beyond a reasonable doubt in all the cop shows, right? But I talk to people about the burden of persuasion. You have to convince, as a lawyer, I have to convince a live human being who we call a judge that I've gotten over my burden of proof. I have to persuade that person. And while I just told you about the conflict, the hypocrisy really, in the Supreme Court's two rulings, they were clearly persuaded very heavily 
by the passage of the 24th Amendment in the case of federal elections. And, um, and the reality is that most states run their state and federal elections at the same time. Now, again, I keep using Virginia where I live as an example. Um, we have odd year elections. We have an election this year, 2021, for governor and our full house of delegates. Um, so not all of them run at the same time. Louisiana, New Jersey, Kentucky run odd year statewide elections. And uh, so they, they don't all go at the same time. So there was still that necessity of addressing state poll taxes or state election poll taxes separate from federal elections. And then did the and I should know this really, um, but did the did the ban on poll tax also include a ban on literacy tests? Because we have uh, one of our listeners, Father Michael Bishop says, as late as 1970, he lived in New Hampshire. And when he went to register to vote, he had to take a literacy test. Um, he had to read something. Did it, did it cover literacy tests as well as poll taxes? It did not. And, um, and, you know, Kathy, those literacy tests go back as just as far as the poll taxes do and for the very same purposes. I think the poll taxes were, because you have to pay money. It, it really uh, not only was a threshold that people of different means, rich people can pay it, poor people can't, um, it had that element to it as well. It, there's at least some logic to the literacy test because if you go back to the founding era, they all talk about, Thomas Jefferson talked about this all the time, um, as did other founding fathers. It is a critical element for constitutional democracy that people must be educated. That for this system of self-governance to work, we have to be well-educated. And that doesn't mean everybody has to have a college degree or anything, but it does mean a certain basic level of ability to take in information and make your own decisions. So there's a little more logic in the history of our constitution to a literacy test than there certainly was to a poll tax, though the use of them were often motivated by the same effort to bar people's access. I don't know when literacy tests finally ended, um, but it was, as you noted, it was later than the poll taxes. Okay. Tova, do you have some questions on the 24th Amendment? I mean, honestly, I had some. Most were uh, answered, but I guess, uh, could you talk about, um, I guess, more modern day voter expansion efforts? Because I know um, people after, like, were, were there efforts after, um, poll taxes were eliminated to try to make voting more expansive um, and eliminate more barriers. And could you talk about that? Um, just well, more course, modern day iterations? In a similar time, um, the, I'm trying to remember, was it the 26th Amendment that lowered the age of voting in federal elections to 18? So Tova, that continued, that kind of attitude continued. Um, and, um, uh, you know, there's beyond those categories, of course, you had the 19th Amendment that gave women the right to guaranteed women the right to vote. States were already doing that, by the way, um, in 1919, so 102 years ago. Uh, so this has been a pattern that we've been on. And, and now, no, now the only bar really anywhere in the country from an adult voting in America is if you have a felony criminal record. And in that instance, it's only in some states. Some states have said, no, uh, you lose your civil rights when you get convicted of a felony. Other states have decided not to do that. That's really the only difference. And, and that's, of course, not because of your race or your gender. That is a decision um, that states make as a policy matter based on behavior that you've chosen to do. So yes, different states come out differently on how to treat that situation, but it is at least within the control of the individual who may or may not be able to vote um, because they've committed a felony or they haven't. So 
Um, that's the that's the main. It's really the only one left any longer. Even even mental incapacity doesn't keep you from voting. And one might really wonder when you see some people who clearly are not in their full faculties come in with someone is who's actually doing the voting? Is it the person they come in with or is it the individual making a decision? Um, so, you know, those are, and I, I, I've worked in the area uh, with the mentally ill and so forth for well over a decade. So that's an area that is of particular interest to me and um, has been for a long time. So there are, there are situations that are still out there, but I don't know that they're addressed anymore from a, on a discriminatory basis per se, like where the poll taxes came from. That was, uh, that's, that's came straight out of discrimination. It was a, it was a, it was a bank shot attempt to keep people out of voting. And how is it um, constitutionally justified to take away uh, voting rights based on uh, criminal status? Well, um, for starters, that goes all the way back to the founding era. And when we're trying to understand what the constitution means, including amendments to the constitution, we go back to the era when that was written. For the amendments we've been talking about today, that was the late 50s and early 60s. Um, for the constitution itself and the Bill of Rights, it was the founding period. And um, then in the civil, there were the Civil War amendments, the 13th ending slavery, the 14th uh, providing um, equal justice under the law, the 15th guaranteeing voting uh, for former slaves, black citizens. Uh, among they and they all they all did other things too, but those are the the main elements. And so we look at what was considered by the proposers and ratifiers of those amendments when interpreting them. And at that time, all of those states excluded felons from voting. It was understood by all participating in those ratifications that that was not being impaired. By impaired, I mean the state's power to do it. Because remember, anything the federal government isn't given the power to do in the constitution remains with the states and with the people under the 10th amendment. And so the states have a lot of freedom of action. Um, and it's why one state is so different from another. It's one of the the benefits of our federal system is we can have those differences and we can live together under one roof um, by letting states do different things. Um, and then this is kind of tangential, but what do you think about the efforts to make uh, election day a federal holiday? Could it be framed as, you know, I don't know, not discriminating against people based on, you know, economics, if you, if you can't leave your <laughs> job like could that be considered a poll tax like if you have to take a day off work to go vote no. or go into work late and you lose money no, no <laughs> if a state you know if a state were to crunch down its voting hours let's say to 10 a.m to 4 p.m um then you might start having a problem but certainly during my lifetime which is now pretty long um the opposite has been true. I'll, again, I use the state I know best, my own. Virginia's polls have been open for a long time from 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. And we are not or haven't historically been a no excuse absentee voting state. But one of the excuses that is written into law is that if it takes you more than 11 hours from door to door to do your work and to get home, you can vote absentee. So, um, and I think you've, you'll find similar hours uh, or more in many other states and similar reasons for absentee voting. And, those, and that's just in the states that don't allow um, any, what they call any reason absentee voting. What they really have is an election season instead of an election day at that point. <clears throat> Those are all my questions. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Very fascinating. And Toba may have to be getting to class pretty soon. So if, if Toba drops off, it, 
it's not because she lost power because of the snowstorm. It's because she's going to class. But Tova, thank you so much for all your great questions. We do have a few more uh, questions from our listeners. Uh, Lucia Booth asks, is citizenship a voting requirement in the Constitution? The Constitution, and that's an excellent question. I would, uh, you hit me with a pop quiz here. Um, I believe the answer is that it is in federal law, but not specifically in the Constitution per se. But until the last few years, there was never any consideration given to non citizens voting anywhere. Um, that is a very recent phenomenon. And unfortunately, like the DC statehood discussion today, rather than being advanced on its own merits for reasons that might be positive, it's really been advanced as an attempt to gain political advantage and, um, and, and to make political statements. And um, you know, that's just, when, when anything comes forward that way, from, from either party, it becomes a target for the other party to undo when control switches. It's why it's so important. It's why the Constitution has a two thirds amendment proposal requirement and a three quarter ratification. The founders are trying to build in what amounts to a national consensus approach to making major changes like that. So that they'd have to be, now they didn't think in terms of bipartisan because there weren't any parties at the time, but what we would today call bipartisan is what they wanted. They wanted to see that, uh, they didn't wanna see factions using the holding of power to solidify their own power or to gain more power. They wanted to see everyone working together and, and they didn't wanna let factions rule the day what we today call parties, they would have called factions. George Washington would have said the word with a very bitter edge to it. He hated them. So um, at the existence, not people uh, of, of those factions. So, um, and uh, you know, uh, political parties have played some positive roles in our history and they've played a uh, not so positive role in some respects as well. Yes, George Washington warned us about that in his farewell address. He did. So um, Edna Eckel asks, why is each state allowed to determine their own format and rules for federal elections? It seems to me that what we now have is unequal weighting of one state against another. Um, so the, the weighting, um, I'll start with that, is determined by their electors and that's straight population. And we recalculate it every 10 years as is happening right now when, as they finish up the census, um, every state always has two senators, that's not recalculated, and you get one elector for each congressional representative. What does get shifted around some is where are the 435 congressmen and women from? And as the population shifts, those seats can shift. And each of those seats represents one electoral vote in a presidential election. But to the, so that's the second part of the question. That's the weighting. So they're not weighted much different. I mean, you, there is value to winning a state because states are considered this important sovereign entity, not quite a nation, but it was the states that built the federal government, not the other way around. And, um, and they wanted to retain some independent existence for some of the reasons Tova and I were talking about. They, they are allowed to do things differently. And the system was set up to make sure they could do things differently so that people of different cultures or ideas or ideals could live the way they wanted to without being forced to live the way other people in the country might want them to. Unfortunately, we've lost that tolerance on the political level to a great degree. There's a lot of attempt to to make states do what the federal government wants to order them to do instead of letting them do their own thing. In the first part of the question, why do states get to run federal elections different in every state? That is an excellent question. 
and it's because the Constitution says so. The Constitution explicitly gives states the authority over elections. The federal government has no role in executing the election itself. The states do that. It's called the, the place, time, manner portion of the Constitution. States determine the place, they determine the time, like I told you, 6 a.m. to 7 p.m. They determine the manner, how can election take place? Will you have no excuse absentee voting or not? Um, those kinds of things are left to states to decide and that is explicitly written into the Constitution. And it was part of the founders' protection against the federal government taking too much control from the states. We have another question from one of our students that might well uh, have to do with what state the student is in. But the student asks, can you vote the same year you turn 18? I'll be 18 in July. So I am not aware of any state, it, it isn't just the year you turn 18, it's you have to turn 18 before election day. And, um, but if you do, uh, your state must have a way to register you to vote beforehand. And in Virginia, and this happened with one of my daughters, she voted in a primary at the age of 17 because she would be 18 by the time the general election came. And your, your ability to vote is measured by your age on an age basis, is measured by your age on election day. So uh, you can slip in there a little early for some nominations um, if you're paying close attention and you register to vote as early as you possibly can. But all the states have to let you vote if you're 18 by election day. And our student who asked the question just told us he's uh, the student is in New York. Okay, so that's good to know. And and we do hope all of our students who are listening will will register to vote and vote. Uh, it's just Absolutely. so important. And we've got just a little time for a few more questions. Patricia Sepp asks, "Isn't the federal government trying to pass a bill?" She thinks maybe the numbers HR one that will change states' rights on elections. Do you know anything about that? I do. HR1 contains an enormous number of mandates on states. It's really unusual legislation. And having looked at some of what they're trying to do, you'll remember our discussion here just a moment ago that states have control over elections. A lot, I think, this is just Ken, but I'm a former attorney general. I've paid attention to these things. I think a lot of what is in that bill would be found to be unconstitutional because it's the federal government telling states what they have to do in elections. And the constitution has said that that is the province of the states. Now, the federal government's been allowed to order some things like something called motor voter, um, but they did that largely through their spending power. They said, if you're gonna get, I think it was transportation money from the federal government, states, you have to offer voter registration in your Department of Motor Vehicles. And, um, and that's how what's called motor voter came about. The other area where the federal government has some significant say is in how the military is able to access voting. So my son-in-law is a US Army officer. He lives at the moment in Colorado, but he is a Virginia resident. Military members get to keep their home state of residency no matter where the military might move them. So he has to have the ability to vote in Virginia and the federal government can protect his ability to have those votes. You know, we were talking about the Civil War earlier. In the 1864 presidential election, there was no absentee voting. Lincoln made sure that his generals gave all their soldiers on a rotating basis time off to get home and vote. And they did, and they voted overwhelmingly for Abraham Lincoln, uh -huh. which some surprised some people because they were miserable out in the field and all the rest, but they were committed to winning. And, um, but they had to go all the way home to vote. 
And that was the most extraordinary circumstances probably ever. I'm not sure how they did it in World War II. Um, I don't know that history as well as the Civil War, but uh, there's no question that um, for, for that rare piece of, um, of voting for, for military members, the federal government can have a say. Well, thank you. And we are just a little bit before three o'clock and we certainly wanna be respectful of your time. Um, are there any closing comments that you'd like to make before we wrap up? I just appreciate you all and what you're doing here and, and to have so many students, um, not just listening about to a discussion about the constitution, but asking really good questions and uh, being this engaged, I'm just very impressed and uh, gives me a lot of hope for, uh, for the next generation um, because you know, the Constitution is only as valued as the citizens value it and, if, and your attention to it and learning about it is extremely helpful in, in, in spreading that. So I wanna thank all the students you all have gotten here and um, Kathy and Jeanette and Lisa and, and I know Tova was on earlier, um, really appreciate the work you all are doing to make this possible. Well, we just, we're so honored to have you, to have a former attorney general, uh, especially for the state of Virginia. Jeanette and I are Virginians, and that's just particularly special to us. And thank you also for your incredible service uh, in the Department of Homeland Security. You've kept our country safe, and we thank you for that. And um, we're excited that you're at the Heritage Foundation now. We love the Heritage Foundation, and and just, um, or we know that, that You've got a lot uh, of different ways that you could spend your day. So we're just very grateful that you would spend an hour with us today. Thank you so much for being with us. My pleasure.